We've had a few technical difficulties, can you tell? Technical difficulties always keep you young. I think I may need to be, is there somebody who operates, uh, Mark Walls? Can you go turn my volume up a little bit in the back? Um, so, uh, uh, smart Alex, I tell you what. Appreciate my tech crew dealing with um, iffy, iffy uh, tech conditions right now, but pushing through nonetheless. Appreciate their help. Mm -hmm. Couple things as we start. First of all, did you all enjoy breakfast? Yes. Yes. We had a world-class breakfast. Thank you, Tim and Debbie Albert. We really appreciate you all. Um, and I, I came in this morning and said, well, Debbie got busy and just went to Walmart to get the muffins. No, she ordered the muffin boxes from Amazon. So, thank you, Debbie. It was awesome. She cooked all day yesterday, and we enjoyed it this morning. So, last session, we talked all about what the Bible says about homosexuality. And today, our focus is on what all this means to us, to Ashland First United Methodist Church. Just... To remind you, what is at stake is two things. First, the ordination, um, recognizing the gifts of gay folks, and also uh, marriages of homosexuals being allowed to be done in Methodist churches by our clergy. So what we are really determining today is this. If we want to remain United Methodists, if our theological position changes. I expect that you will have questions. I'm going to say that again. I expect that you will have questions. You deserve the opportunity to ask those questions and to have me try to answer them. But if you all ask questions all throughout my presentation, it, I will never get through it. So I'm going to ask that you write your questions down. There's a little piece of paper that looks something like this right here. If you have questions, Write them down. I'll come after we go into table discussion. I'll come and collect your questions. And I'll also ask if anybody has some from the floor. So if you got questions, please feel to, free to, to <laughs> fill those out. And I'll come and get them. A few years ago, while I was a student at Asbury College, uh, I noticed a plaque on the back wall of the place where we had chapel three times a week. It was Hughes Auditorium. It was a quote from a famous alumnus of both the college and the seminary, a missionary by the name of E. Stanley Jones. As we begin our work today, it seemed like a pretty good place to start. And it was supposed to be on a beautiful picture here for you all to see. But you're going to have to take my word on it. This is what the quote says. Here we enter a fellowship. Sometimes we will agree to differ. Always we will resolve to love and unite to serve. I'm gonna say that again for the folks in the back. Here we enter a fellowship. Sometimes we will agree to differ. Always we will resolve to love and unite to serve. Before I talk anymore, I'm gonna invite our board chair to come forward and open us with a word of prayer. Eric, will you come forward? Good morning. Uh, everybody would please bow their hair, heads in a prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we ask you to uh, uh, please uh, uh, bless everyone here today. Uh, we, uh, uh, we appreciate all the food that was prepared for everyone this morning. Help make it nourishing to our bodies. And uh, uh, also ask you to bless the hands that prepared it. Uh, we ask you to please open our hearts and minds this morning as we uh, listen to Pastor Jeff uh, discuss all the all the issues that we're facing right now, and please guide us to make uh, the right decisions when the time is right for our church. And these things we ask in your name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Eric. So years ago, um, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the origins of our denomination. And you may be bored by that information, but I promise you, there's a reason why I'm covering it. Um, in 1968, the UMC was formed from two major denominations. The first was the Methodist Church. The second was the Evangelical United Brethren. The EUB came from the German Reform Movement from the Lutheran Church. The Methodist Church 
was actually uh, several churches that came together, including the Methodist Episcopal Church, North and South. In other words, they had just come back together a few years before to become the Methodist Church again. And then we joined with some other denominations to make a new church. It was not two or four churches. It was closer to seven or eight that all came together to do this within about 10 years. And it gave us, at the time, the largest Christian denomination in the United States. What they didn't do was come up with one theological document that they all agree, agreed on theologically. In fact, to this day, if you open your United Methodist Book of Discipline, if you read that on Saturdays for fun, then you will see <laughs> the original Wesleyan Articles of Religion that were as common and, and, and accessible in the Methodist discipline. And then you will see in the very next section the United Brethren Articles of Faith. Why do I would tell you this? Because I want you to understand that theological disagreements are not new for Methodists. There was never a good old days when we all agreed on everything having to go on in our church. We never were truly united in our theology. What happened is for a time, our differences in these theological points were less important than what we could accomplish together in mission and in ministry. And for many years, that's what we did. But there was never a time when we were all together. I know this because our first general conference was in 1972 after the unification of the church. And those arguments in 1972, that was our first kerfuffle, our first big theological breakdown and disruption to the work over the last, over uh, the years. The first annual conference, we disagreed on this. And we disagreed about it every time we've gathered since. We have three branches of governance in the United Methodist Church. I know you probably feel like you're in a civics class, but again, I want you to understand when I use words like book of discipline and general conference, what they mean. So the most important branch of our governance is the legislative branch. We call it general conference, and every four years, we gather somewhere in the world. It's an equal number of delegates, lay and clergy. We make any necessary changes to our book of discipline. We gather for worship. We gather to look at, in detail at the legislation that comes forth from the lower conferences and decide how we want to do things as a global church. General Conference is Methodist from all over <laughs> the world. And it's the only place where the beliefs and practice of the church can change. There are also jurisdictional conferences, which are basically regional. It would be the equivalent of our, I guess, our county government. These jurisdictional conferences meet every four years before our general conference, and it's where we elect bishops to the church. We are in the southeast jurisdiction of the United States um, and southeast jurisdiction of the UMC. We are together with conferences from Tennessee, Virginia, North and South Carolina, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Alabama, all the way down the line. And all the legislation that makes its way to the general conference floor has to go through our jurisdictional conference. And it starts at our local government, which for us is the annual conference. Annual conference, we belong to the Kentucky Annual Conference. We gather every year in June to do the work of the church, keep ourselves in order, and keep ourselves moving forward as a church. So you can see, I actually put on the table a piece of paper that looks something like this right here. Some of them are stapled and some of them are front and back. It is statements from our current book of discipline on human sexuality. I want you to get a chance to look at the language as it currently is in our church. Um, I include copies on your table about what we say about ordination and marriage currently. 
If you really look at this language, if you really look at what we say we believe, I think you will see in the language, in the way this is talked about, a back and forth, a pull to include everyone that we can and also set standards for our life together. The struggle is evident in the language. Most of the time, language changes in the book of discipline happen slowly. A word or a paragraph or a phrase at a time. What I think we can probably expect at the next general conference is for our church to continue to be more permissive and allowing gay marriages in our churches and more open towards ordination of gays and lesbians. As attitudes shift in the world in which we live, those attitudes have to play out in our legislative body as a church. It's the way things have always worked. A few things that I want you to understand, basics. The second branch is the least important. You can even tell them I said it. It's the Council of Bishops. The Council of Bishops. We have a bishop. His name is Leonard Fairley. He came and preached here a few years ago for our anniversary. Um, our bishops gather twice a year. Primarily what they do is just keeping each other in line. They maintain relationships with other denominations. They give oversight to the daily work of our, de of our denomination as it plays out on the annual conference level. Um, they meet, they just met, as a matter of fact. They can also request rulings and clarification from the third branch of our government, the judicial branch. And this should sound familiar, by the way, for those of you who paid attention in history class. The judicial branch of our government is our Supreme Court. It's called the Judicial Council. There's the Supreme Court of the UMC. They use our current book of discipline, our current guidelines about what we believe in our church law. They can and have voted down actions of the annual conference as being against the discipline. There are also judicial branches, as you might expect, at the local level and at jurisdictional levels. If something is disagreed upon mightily, it goes to our Supreme Court. Um, there's, so we have our three branches of government. Judicial, legislative, and executive. When I was an ordained an elder in the Methodist Church, I stood up and made... Oh, it's almost working. Okay. Well, <laughs> when I was ordained an elder in the Methodist Church, I stood up and made promises. A lot of them. Among the things I promised, I said that I would uphold the discipline of the church. That if I break a rule from our life together, that I can face discipline from the larger church. Um, if it's really bad, I can actually lose my credentials as a United Methodist pastor. So over the last few years, one of the things that's happened in our church is that more and more pastors have been intentionally breaking the discipline of the church by performing weddings of LGBTQIA persons. They see it as, frankly, a matter of injustice, as a way to challenge the church. The Judicial Council has taken several of these actions up, including, along with some marriages, also the ordination of LGBTQIA folks, as well as the ordination of gay bishops in the Methodist Church. The Judicial Council has taken these actions up and handed them down to the annual conferences to be enforced. Some of the annual conferences have done just that. Others have not. Again, this has further challenged the unity of the United Methodist Church. Progressives on this issue see this as a matter of injustice. It's something wrong that we need to get right by any means necessary. Conservatives on this issue see it as a matter of biblical authority. It's a matter of covenant. Our last normal annual conference was in 2016. The issues of ordination and marriage of LGBTQIA folks was again incredibly divisive. And they recommended in the middle of that general conference that we hold a special general conference for four days in 2019 to deal with this issue and decide it once and for all. They did it 
in St. Louis, Missouri. They uh, looked at several plans and options, and all of them were along the same line. A looser connection of Methodists, so that we could keep our name and stay together, but allow for a progressive wing and a more traditional wing. All of those plans that were put forward over these four days of general conference failed. They failed. The closest thing that passed, the th only thing that passed, as a matter of fact, was the traditional plan, which upheld our current theological language on these matters. The vote on the traditional plan was 52% to 48%, less than 20 votes over, over 1,000 delegates. The plan, it was a good plan. Let's so take it up again in 2020 until we got this right. Something else happened in 2020. What was it? It was COVID. Mm -hmm. It's the worst, isn't it? Yes. It's a mess. And that year, we did not meet. We did not meet the next year. We were thinking about meeting in 2022. And the church said, we're not ready for you to do that yet because we're a global entity and we have people who cannot yet get um, permission to travel and others who've not had their vaccines that may want it in foreign countries. And so the first time that they are allowing us to meet again is May of 2024 in Minnesota. The other thing big that happened at this specially called General Conference in 2019 was the addition of a new paragraph. I actually have copies of this up on the table. Um, it's called paragraph 2553. And if you really want to see it, you're welcome to come give it a good gander when we're done here. Um, essentially, it allows a way out for churches that are unhappy with any changes in the language over this issue. It allows them to leave with their property, but the churches are required to have a 67% vote to leave the UMC. They also have to pay full apportionments for the current conference year and the next conference year, as well as paying towards future liability of pension and health care costs for retired clergy. The paragraph has an end date as it currently stands. Remember, this was taken up in 2019 when we thought we were meeting again in 2020. But the end date they gave it then was the end of December 2023. With all the uncertainty in the life of the global church, some congregations are leaving the UMC, including churches in our county, via paragraph 2553. In December of 2022, we had 57 churches out of 800 some in the Kentucky Annual Conference decide to leave at a specially called annual conference last year. We are expecting more this year at annual conference when we meet again uh, as Kentucky, including several churches, like I said, in our county. In talking to the pastors of these churches that are leaving, all of them had planned to wait and watch what would happen in 2024, <laughs> but things changed for all sorts of reasons. Some of it had to do with jurisdictional conference, which just occurred in November of last year. All of the candidates for bishop in the southeast jurisdiction were progressive on this particular issue, open and affirming. Some of our conservative brothers and sisters did not like that. Um, all the jurisdictions in the U.S. also passed some resolutions. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go through all those, but I'll answer questions about it if you want to know what those resolutions were. Suffice it to say, they were enough to raise the blood pressure of some of our conservative brothers and sisters. So, so you know, this brings us to what we are really here for. We have to begin to consider and to figure out what we want to do as Ashland First UMC because we are different than all the other churches around us. Our folks are different. We have different makeup. Um, each church, in fact, is unique. So there are four options. The first one is to stay United Methodist. Uh, in this case, we would essentially go with whatever the language says moving forward on this issue. Um, 
There are positives and negatives that I'm going to try to walk you through on all of this. For staying United Methodist, the positive is it's what we know. It's the way we've always functioned from our beginning as a church. It's Wesleyans and then United Methodists. We have a way to move pastors. We have Episcopal oversight. We have accountability. We have support for all the things that we are doing. The other positive is that we retain a global reach and mission and a connection to believers all over the world. The third is kind of a positive and a negative, frankly. We get to be in a church that represents a wide variety of opinions on this and lots of other topics. At our best, sitting at a table with people who don't see things the way we see them is good for us spiritually. It moves us towards growth in God's love and spiritual maturity. At our worst, it makes it to where we can't do anything. and We're fighting like cats and dogs. It paralyzes us. The other ne negative is it's uncertain as to whether or not this will actually happen in 2024. This language may not change until 2028 or 2032. We don't know for sure. We have believers from all over the world who believe a wide variety of things. And for the first time in our history, we have more believers from outside the United States than inside the United States. So it is hard to guess all that will occur over three weeks in May of 2024. So the second option before us is to join the Global Methodist Church. It launched officially in May of 22 when the General Conference Committee announced that we would not meet until 2024. It launched in the state of Kentucky in November of 2022 after jurisdictional conferences. This has become one of the big landing spots for conservatives on this issue who want to leave the UMC. Positive, there's no question about what they believe on this issue. <clears throat> they are against ordination and marriages of gays and lesbians, um, clearly. The other positive is that the majority of their stances, the majority of their articles of faith come directly from the United Methodist Book of Discipline. We're not completely starting over theologically. And it's proposing a scaled-down version of church hierarchy. Negatives for joining the GMC? A lot is unknown. They have not had a gathering in the state of Kentucky yet. Um, they currently have not voted to adopt any set of theological beliefs. And they have only a transitional document with what those would be. They don't currently have a way to move clergy. They don't currently have significant oversight from a bishop or superintendents. What they have is essentially two DSs, our former DSs, who were retired clergy and turned in their credentials to United Methodists so that they could help start this new denomination in Kentucky. Um, the other negative is, frankly, it requires a two-thirds vote of our congregation to leave the UMC over these issues. The current deadline in our congregational vote, if we are to leave the UMC, is coming soon. It would have to happen by March the, 25th, or March the 15th, 2023. You should also know there is potential that the bishop can announce a 2023 December annual conference, just as he did last time, or last year, to give churches more time to really consider what they want to do. Mm -hmm. The third option before us is that we could leave the United Methodist Church and become independent. I will be honest, a lot of uncertainty about this because we essentially have to write a statement of beliefs. We have to write a new polity. We have to write and come up with how to do everything. Um, it's a big headache. We may have enough lawyers in the building to pull it off, but it would take several years to get this right. The fourth option before us is to pray and wait and watch and see how things unfold at General Conference 2024. This is uncertain, but it's an option. South Georgia Annual Conference recently announced 
that they would extend the date for leaving the church to December of 2024 after General Conference because they believe it's in honoring what 2553, paragraph 2553 wanted to do and it would give, would lower the anxiety of churches as they examine what's going on and what they want to do together. It's through a different paragraph, 2549, um, but it would essentially give churches the chance to reassess. I'm talking to Brad Smart, our district superintendent. He is very hopeful that we will hear that something like that may happen in Kentucky. However, that also has to happen with the approval of the conference trustees, and it's not yet been announced. I've also had several chances to talk to Brad about this, and when I express anxiety over timelines, he recommended that we focus on doing the process of, of examining all this and discerning what we want to do as a congregation well. And he said he was confident that we would hear as we do it that we'll receive more time. Many also believe that at our next general conference in 2024, we're going to have another door that is opened, like 2553, for churches that are still discerning where they are. <coughs> I know that's a lot. I dumped a lot in you. For, forgive me. But, but I want to tell you one more thing. And that's what's next. What we're doing here. Um, we're putting together an advisory team. A church. It's 10 to 12 folks who represent who we are as a whole congregation. When I say who we are as a congregation, I mean we're going to have some young folks and some older folks. We're going to have male and female, liberal and progressive. Their role is not to vote for what we want to do as a church. That's your job. Their role is going to be to help me figure out how to lead us through this and to spend more than a half an hour looking at each of these plans and what's going to be best for our church. They don't have authority to make decisions for our church, but we're going to make some recommendations to the administrative council. They also will be listening to you on what you want to see happen here at Ashland First United Methodist Church. Um, today, the last thing that we're going to kind of do after we move in some table discussions, before you leave, I put this on the table. This has a couple of questions. The questions are, it, are, are these. First, if I had to vote today for <laughs> which I want to do, here's what I'd vote for. The second is, do you think we should hold a vote to leave the UMC, and why or why not? What I'm really wanting to get is why you're voting for what you're voting for, okay? The last one is what else do you want us to know as we begin to sort through this as a congregation? I recognize this stuff is scary and anxiety-inducing. I want you to know this. I really appreciate your presence today. I appreciate your investment and your love for Ashland First United Methodist Church. And I appreciate uh, you showing up on a Saturday to, to figure this out. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to the tables next to you, to the folks around you. If it's just you and your spouse at a table, why don't you join another? Um, and what I want you to look at is, is these questions of table discussion questions. Make sure you get to number four, okay? If you want to start with that one, you can. I'm also going to be coming around and picking up questions. Appreciate you, folks. It's interesting, excuse me, to know that South Georgia voted to extend the time. North Georgia, which is the biggest annual conference in the U.S., has put a moratorium on this affiliation. I saw that. And I saw why, too. Yeah. <coughs> I will also tell you. I don't have to pay attention to him. He, uh, he, 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 would that be said? Would that be said? <laughs> <laughs>
All right, folks, I'm going to give you about two more minutes to talk, okay? Two more minutes. Is it an easy one? It's a pretty easy one. Okay. from you here. The good news is they're all really simple. Wait, that's not right at all. <laughs> okay. Question number one. If we leave the UMC, who pays the pastor's pension? We do. In fact, we do already. But the question is, I think, if we go something other than United Methodists, what about pension and insurance and all that? A few years ago, the Methodist folks who handle all of our insurance and pension began building bridges to handle some of that. To allow Global Methodist or Wesleyan churches to leave and still participate in our pension plans and health insurance plans. Smart thinking, right? The bad news is until they are recognized as a denomination by the United Methodist Church, that won't start. Got it? Okay. No, so what was the answer? <laughs> <laughs> the same folks 
if we were to leave UMC and go GMC, eventually it would be the same folks handling pension and, and health insurance. However, we would still have to pay a portion of the retired UMC clergy pension and health insurance um, for folks that have come through and led our church. So um, that number, again, if we were to leave and somehow to get two-thirds vote saying we want to do this, then it would require this year's apportionment and next year's, which would be around $80,000. It would also be these portions of these two things. So numbers-wise, I was asked to guess. I'm guessing somewhere between $170,000 and $220,000, but that's a guess. We would have to request that we do that. Um, and get those numbers from our DS. And, yeah. So, Jeff, I think you've done an exceptional job. Oh, stop. Uh, presenting what you know. Did you write that? No. But, I still can't decide based on what we know so far. You himself still has not definitively stated what they believe. When you first set foot, for example, into a Baptist church, First thing they hand you is a pamphlet that tells you all they are about. It is hard being a connectional church. It is hard being a connectional church. We're not Baptists. That means what we do is connected to what they do in Kenya and what they do in the Philippines. That is awesome because it gives us a worldwide reach because we get to sit at the same table and make things, beliefs up with people who are vastly different and have vastly different experiences. It can make day-to-day -day life difficult. And so the things that we ask you when you join the Methodist Church are, will you proclaim Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and serve him in your life? And then we ask, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and serve it by prayers, presence, gifts, service? Never do we tell you when you join the Methodist Church, this is what you have to believe about abortion. This is what you have to believe about all these issues. It's never been the way that it's been done, and it can be very frustrating. Sorry. Sorry, I didn't answer that at all. Um, what message are we given about open minds, hearts, and doors if we choose global? If we choose global, we are saying that we will not ordain homosexuals, do not recognize their gifts, because we interpret that as a sin. We are also saying that we do not recognize their marriages. Here's the other part of that. What is that saying to people? <laughs> it's going to turn them away. It just is. It's going to turn them away. I, I have a lot of friends on all sides of this, and all of them say the same thing. We love everybody. You can still come to our church. That's a big no up front. It really is. So we've got to discern what's right here, church. Okay, how does the March 15th, 2023 vote to leave the UMC, how does the date to depart get amended? It's above my pay grade. There is a committee that meets with the bishop about twice a year. I don't know when their next meeting is. I've been told it's soon. But there is a committee because we are method is we're very anal retentive everything has its place and so there is a committee that can make that decision and i'm told that they will meet soon i can't guarantee that that date will be changed someone asked in the back what if we to try to have a vote by march 15th and then we're given more time will that vote count yes it will will there be a date further on open by the united methodist church at general conference 24 maybe it's not guaranteed. We don't know. So what we've got to decide is, do we think we have two-thirds? I'll leave that up to you all. Will that committee meet prior to March 15th? Yes, sir. I've been told they will. Yep. Okay. What kind of financial requirement is involved in leaving the United Methodist Church? I think I've already answered that. Any other questions around that one? Real estate. Real estate. Right now, all of our property, you're not going to like this. It's been this way forever in the United Methodist Church. Part of what has made us united is something called the trust clause. 
says that everything we own belongs to the United Methodist Church. So in order for us to, for this 2553, it essentially releases the trust clause for those churches that will pay all these things. Church courts, the Judicial Council has said that none of that is paying for property. It's paying for these other things. Does that help? So does okay, sorry. Is each congregation required uh, for other congregations mm -hmm. that have had to go through this yes. to purchase their buildings back? Yes. Is that the case? It's not. It's not. They've not called it purchasing your building back. They've said it is one two years of our giving to the larger church that we do. That's ten percent of our budget. Two years of that. And then these other things. The Judicial Council says we can't have churches buying their property. So that's not technically what it is. Those churches that are leaving, however, do get their property with it. If um, they meet those other... If they meet two-thirds vote and paying all this by the time annual conference happens and it's voted by a simple majority at annual conference. Um, now, here's the other thing that I haven't mentioned. If we leave the UMC, one of the things that we have to do is get rid of everything that has the cross and flame on it. So we'll have to have new signage made. We'll have to um, hymn books that have the cross and flame. We're not technically allowed to use anymore. Now, will a DS who used to be our DS come around and look and say, oh, I don't know. But that's part of what's in here. Is our brand changed? Then our brand changes. Okay. This says, if FUMC would decide to leave the United Methodist Church, what is required financially to leave? Please be specific. I think I've answered that. Well, maybe not. Have I answered that? No, because right now, the United Methodist Church owns this building. Yes. But we could leave and own it for 200000 Yes. Parsley. And the parsonage. I had a, 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 a bishop in our church wrote earlier in the week, this is not a deal. Like, this is not a financial deal. Um, if we leave the UMC, um, then we could take all those things with us. Um, but right now, did you know until I just told you that the building was not technically ours? Yes. You knew that? I'm figuring most of you probably did. Um, this is what it is. It's, it's part of life and, and how things have always functioned in the UMC. It's part of what's kept us together. Frankly, the it was not enough to keep us together. So, um, yeah. I didn't help at all, did I? Well, I mean, I knew the church did not belong to us. But yeah. I, I didn't know that. Well, I don't, I don't know that those are our number. That's a guess. Um, part of the reason that I'm putting this team together is because if I was to ask for those numbers by the date in February um, from our um, district superintendent, I have to have other people making that request instead of the pastor. If we're to have a vote, I can't call a vote of the church. That has to be... Um, some other leaders of our church. So that's part of the reason we're putting this team together to consider what's before us. Well, don't even consider them as voting. We're talking about church voting. So what happened when they voted was a different deal. They decided that they could no longer support themselves as a congregation. And so they decided to join with South Ashland and become a new church. So what happened to their facility? Well, they are getting ready to sell it. Um, it'll go to Cornerstone, yes. Just as it would to us if we were to sell the building. But technically on the deed, it's the United Methodist Church. They didn't have to say that you didn't own it. So why would they be getting it? Why would they be getting it? Because the discipline allows for it. Yes. When we sold our stake in Parsons, we kept it. Yes. Okay.
Okay, so if we vote to leave the UMC, you are then leaving as our pastor since you are ordained in the Methodist Church. Um, I think uh, what we were asked to do from the get-go in this process is to put our churches in the position to make the best decision for them, which is going to be different from a church in Pikeville or Lexington or down the street. So my job, as I've been told by our conference leaders, is to not sway you one way or the other. And so when it comes to this, I'm not weighing in. I'm just not. Um, my job is to help you make a decision. And then I'll make whatever decision I need to make. I'm sorry. I wish I could tell you more. If you want to come and see me in the office, I'd be glad to talk to you. Tell you everything I think. But I'm not going to sway the congregation one way or the other because that's not my job here. And I believe what he just said is you guys aren't going to sway him either. <laughs> his choice is his alone, right. regardless of what we decide. Right. He gets to make his own decision. So you decide if you stay in that Yes, ma'am. And I will tell you, I know this is not fun for you. I have friends who are conservative as they come. Bless them. And I have friends who are as liberal as can be. Bless them. Um, me saying goodbye to some of them has been gut-wrenching. I had a, a group gathering with, with four friends this, this past 24 hours. I just came back yesterday afternoon. And we meet for accountability. They're some of my closest friends in the world. Some of them will not be in covenant with me moving forward. And that's really hard. It's really hard. Um, it's okay. It's not the first time we've done this. It's the United Methodist Church. Um, it's not the first time we've done this and gone through this. This is our thing to struggle through. And God has given us everything we need to do that here. So do you have any other questions about the discernment team and everything else? One other question. Sure. So if we do take this vote until March 15th. Yes, ma'am. Um, split up our monies. What do you mean by that, Beth? Uh, pay the apportionment. Yes. But I mean, if we vote by March 15th, then that's, that's it for us. We decided. We have decided. Whatever may change moving forward, we have decided. So we don't have to decide that, though, because nope. it says we can stay for now. Yes. Wait and watch. We're just saying we're UMC. Um, in order to stay UMC, no vote is required. In order to wait and watch, no vote is required. Wait and watch, I have it phrased that way because some of our brothers and sisters who are looking and guessing at what's going to happen, they're saying, well, the United Methodist Church is going to take a hard turn left after 24. And others are saying in a similar fear-based thing, well, the global Methodist Church is going to take a hard turn right Maybe they will, maybe they won't. We don't know. Um, and so that is an option moving forward. Any other questions? Folks, please make sure, two things before I let you go. Please make sure you fill one of these out. If you fill four of these out, I'll know. <laughs> well, maybe I won't know, but Jesus will. Um, so that, that's first. Um, please fill this out. If you have questions, if you have concerns, it's my joy to be your pastor and talk to you and, and answer questions to the best of my ability. I know I've given you a lot. If you have questions and you're confused, you may not be the only one. So please come and see me. Thank you, friends. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, you have led this church for over a hundred years in this place. Lord, would you remind us of what we're here for? Would you help us to be focused in our work of making disciples for Jesus Christ, of spreading your love, of calling people to faith in you, and trust that when they do that, their lives can be transformed. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for walking 
with us through this journey. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, friends.